Coming up on All About Android, it's me, Jason Howell, my co-host Ron Richards, and our guest, Tashaka Armstrong, who's got some awesome perspectives on the new Pixel 6 Pro, or as we call it, the Pixie Sixel Pro. I don't know if we actually called it that throughout the show. Bits and pieces throughout. It had many names. Anyways, we talk all about the Pixel 6 Pro, give it a nice review. We also talk about the Oculus Go, which, yes, runs Android and how it's unlocked. So that's interesting. The Z Flip 3 is now bespoke. Windows 11 can run Android apps. And we have some of your email and a whole lot more coming up next on All About Android. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by AT&T Active Armor. We rely so much on our phones these days and we're always on them, whether it's live streaming content, uh, catching up with family on weekly video calls or watching your favorite podcast. There is no room for fraud calls. And thankfully, AT&T makes customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor, 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call block to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device and service required. Visit att.com slash active armor for details. And by userway.org. Userway ensures your website is accessible, ADA compliant, and helps your business avoid accessibility related lawsuits. The perfect way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. It's not only the right thing to do, it's also the law. Go to userway.org slash twit for 30% off Userway's AI powered accessibility solution. Hello and welcome to All About Android, episode 548, recorded on Tuesday, October 26th, 2021, your weekly source of the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Jason Howell. And I am Ron Richards, as I am updating our doc with a typo that said Pixie 6. Pixie 6. Oh, Pixie see? Six. <laughs> and there we go. Right before the show, if you tuned in live before the show, you would have heard us talk a little bit about, you know, should Google have named this something different? D does this phone, the Pixel 6, deserve to have a different name that sets it apart from its historical Pixel heritage? It, maybe it's the Pixie. The Pixie, P I X E. <laughs> you can you can go to the Google Store now and get your Pixie sticks. Pixie sticks. Oh, uh, Pixie so sticks with yeah. some Pixie um, sticks. <laughs> is that the version of Android is on? Is Android twelve P? Should that be Pixie oh, sticks? I don't know. See, yeah. we, we missed out on that one. That would have been really great synergy, as they say. Uh, joining us tonight, and super thrilled to welcome you to the show, Tashaka Armstrong. Uh, just an awesome guy, but also an awesome guy with an amazing review of the Pixel Six Pro on. Android. Android Central. Uh, welcome to the show tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a, a joy and a pleasure to be here and uh, just geek out about all things Android. Well, you're in the right place because that's what we do each and every week. We geek out about all things Android. And if, if yes. you're game to geek out, I mean, you're, you're with family right now. So I am sure. down. I'm, I'm home then. <laughs> you are home. Uh, before we dive right in, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, you're a content creator. I, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you don't necessarily work for Android Central. You're creating content for different places all across the board. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, my uh, my initial start uh, has been in uh, broadcast television, um, and so I've kind of been all over the place. Uh, I was actually on air as a, a, a tech journalist for a period of time. And uh, then that kind of transition morphed into me doing uh, YouTube videos uh, for the organization that I was doing broadcast reporting for. And then I just found myself doing uh, YouTube videos. Actually, it started because I had a nonprofit and I was teaching internet safety, digital literacy to parents and children. And it was funny because they, I was teaching the parents at PTA meetings and, uh, you know, I, I've, I've got tats and earring and all kinds of stuff. And when I was teaching the parents about internet safety, they were like, oh my God, we want you to teach our children because they would totally listen to you. And I'm <laughs> like, no, I'm not ready to do that. They're teenagers. They're really not going to listen to me. And um, I taught my first class of T 
teens, and I'm kind of a psychology nerd, and I was studying some uh, research on how to get through to teens, and it worked. And there we go. The nonprofit started, and I started uh, doing uh, reviews to teach parents about how to properly use tech to keep their children and their home safe. And it kind of just blew up from there. And and here I am today. Uh, we have our own uh, production company, KLP Media, and KLP Media produces content for uh, outlets on the web uh, doing tech reviews of all different brands, not specifically just Android, but uh, right. consumer technology across the board. Yeah, well, I saw on your Twitter feed you had the uh, the new Apple Watch review, and you even pointed out on that on that review, at least in the tweet, that your one of your children edited the review. Yes. I was like, I was like, life goals right there. You know, my my <laughs> older daughter, she's I I've taught her how to edit an iMovie, you know, little mm -hmm. bits here and there, and then she's taught herself a bunch. She's you know she turns twelve wow. in a, in a couple of months, and so she's been just you know editing random stuff, and I've been super like impressed at how well she's mm -hmm. she's taken to it. And then I saw your tweet, and I was like, maybe that's the goal. Maybe that's the direction. Soon my daughter can edit my videos for me. That's great. There you go. Yep, yep. <laughs> and it's been wonderful because I just there's so I have a full time day job, and then I do all the tech stuff as well. And so it's really been a blessing that my son has really kind of taken to this and enjoys doing it. And you know I pay them, and that of course helps. And, uh -huh. But it also helps me because I only have so much bandwidth uh, yeah. for writing and getting in front of the camera and f having them actually handle post-production uh, is just, it, it's it's been amazing. Yeah, amazing. And, and it gives them experience. And all yeah. That. And, and, and I got and I got to say, there's a certain level of legitimacy for our video viewers who are watching, seeing you at home with the with the uh, plastic bin full of cables and wires behind you, as well as a, a Funko Pop on top box on top. So that I mean, it, it, it's like we're right at home together there. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. Yes, <laughs> That's Absolutely. all of our rooms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Yep. I got my deity and my teleprompter, all that stuff sitting on the sitting on top there. That's awesome. Right on. Well, Tashaka, yeah, it's our pleasure story, to have you. Uh, yeah. uh, KLP Media, talking about being at home, uh, KLP Media actually stands for, uh, God bless my wife, Kelly's Living Room Productions. Nice. Because starting this, she actually allowed me to turn our living room and dining room areas into a studio, essentially. So that's kind of my homage, my honoring of her giving up her space. So, so yeah, that, indeed. Thank you, KLP nice. Media. I, I know all about that. I mean, this this little studio that I'm in right now is literally the corner of our bedroom, of my wife and I's bedroom. So, mm -hmm. you know, she has to put up with the fact that there's this this massive pile of technology <laughs> in the corner of what should be a peaceful place. So I totally feel you. I'm right there with you. Um, well, so this is a big week. Of course, we all oh. have uh, Pixel on the mind or Pixie, depending on how you, how you want to <laughs> name it. Um, so what we thought, uh, anyone who watched last week knows that both Ron and I have the devices. Ron has the Pixel 6. I have the mm -hmm. 6, but I also have the 6 Pro. And so what we decided to do, there it is, Ron's, Ron, I, I have to imagine, like I'm super curious, but what we decided to do is have this week be kind of the focus on the 6 Pro. And we'll do that here at the top. And then next week, we'll do the six. Leo's going out of town. He's going to uh, Mexico. So he's actually going to take this my six pro. I'm going to wipe it after this show. He's going to take it to Mexico and shoot his trip with it, which means okay. I'm going to spend my time with the six for the next week. And then next week, Ron and I, we can come back and we can tell you all about the six and, and how it differs. And this is... That. This is great, Jason, because you have the six pro and Tashaka, you have a six pro, right? So we're getting... That is correct. Each yeah. week... Each week we're getting two opinions on the phone, so it's nice. So we're 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 stretching out the pixel of, uh, but this week's for pros, and I'm very curious because we're we're also if you tuned in before the show, we're also talking about. It seems like you know looking in my you know my Twitter feed and reading you know sites and things like that. It seems to be generally well received, um, and so yeah. I'm dying to hear what you guys think after getting a week to play with it. Yeah, indeed. So let's um let's I guess just dive right in. And I don't envision that my review is going to be some like big, 
you know, insane, comprehensive, every aspect of this device. Because to be quite honest, everybody has that review out right now. If you want to find reviews of the Pixel 6 and the 6 Pro, I mean, there are so many reviews out there. Google, which I think is a testament to how, um, how positive Google is that what they have with this device is, is, you know, different than what they've offered in the past. They said early on, and we talked about it in the show, that they, their plan, that Google's plan was to go all out on promoting the, the six line. And it really seems like they got the six into everybody's hands. Like literally, if, if you enjoyed, if you enjoy smartphones to any degree and you have a channel and you know what I mean? Like so many people have this phone and are doing reviews. So that's great. That just means there's a lot, there's a wealth of information out there. Uh, so I'm going to leave it to the majority of the people that want to go deep diving into all of these things. I'm keeping mine more from just like quality of life perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, how have I enjoyed it over the past week? And I have to say, I was really excited for the 6 Pro. Um, and I have not been uh, dis let down or disappointed, save for a few points, which we can get into. But um, I mean, we have to talk about the design, which I think for me, the curiosity was, okay, seeing it from early on with all the leaks and everything, how is it going to live up to the design that at first when we saw those leaks looked kind of, you know, different enough to be kind of obscure and like, oh, I don't know, like that's, that's eye catching, but is it nice? Is it good? And I knew that once you get a device like this in your hands, that's the real tell, you know, yeah. once it's in your hands, does it look like uh, like a premium, like, is this a device that you're proud of, that you want to like show off? Right. Someone says, hey, what is that phone? Do you want to pull it out? Do you want to show it off? And I have to say that the design is really, really top notch. Like I love some of these features here, the kind of shiny aluminum around the camera. The camera bump gives it a nice kind of like classy extra look to it. Um, it just, you know, I mean, glass is glass. Glass all feels, you know, very similarly, but it doesn't have any sort of hollowness or emptiness to it. It feels like a solid, uh, just a, a solid premium device. What, what are your thoughts as far as like uh, the the design aspect of this, Tishaka? Well, it was funny because when I, when you know, when the leaks were happening, um, I created a meme that I put on my Twitter account and I called the, actually the Pixel 6 and that, that let's see, where did I put that? That orangish uh, color, I called it yes. the uh, the Jordy LaForge edition uh, <laughs> Pixel 6. And uh, cause you know, you had the bat banana clip. And so that's that was like the first thing that came to my mind when I first saw it. But in hand, in person, it really is, it's a striking device because you know, they didn't try to minimize the camera bump by putting it off to the side or or integrating it into the band. It really is just, I mean, it's it's out there and it really is in your face. But the cool thing about this design that I really like, because people seem to really be in to the whole um, table test. And since we're talking about the 6 Pro, let me go ahead and grab that one here. People really seem to be into the whole table test about laying a phone flat and seeing if it rocks with the cameras. And this was genius in that since it spans the width of the phone, it doesn't rock. I mean, if you push the top of it, it rocks a bit. But when you lay this on a desk, it's sol it's stable and it's flat. So well, what's, what's to add to that, Sashaka, what's funny, and I know, you know, I only have this, the, 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 the regular six, not the pro, but I handed it to my wife and she commented that the camera bump was helping her hold on to it. She's like, oh, it's yeah. not slipping out of my, it's not slipping out of my hand because that little wedge is resting on my yeah. finger. And I was like, oh, yeah. that's really interesting. That's like a, a little bit of ergonomics yeah. that I don't know if that was part of the design or not, but it, it does seem to work. So, and, and the welcome edition, because yeah. because this is a slippery phone. Like if you don't have a case on this thing, you know, as with any you know glass sandwich, you know, if and I'm I'm definitely the per, the spokesperson for dropping phones, um, you know, and and also the sides, like I don't know if you can see this in the in the shot, you know, the I I actually thought this was stainless steel, but it's actually aluminum. It's a polished aluminum um, uh, edges. And uh, that as well, because it's polished, has like a slipperiness to it. So yeah. the fact that you can kind of rest your finger on the camera bump, that is actually a feature that gives it a little bit of that stability. I, I tend to opt for the case, though, just because I don't trust myself. But <laughs> there you go. Well, and, and I really like the case 
on the 6 Pro because it really, um, it's kind of a thick, a little bit of a thick case, but with it on the phone, it really kind of minimizes the, the camera bump. So if you're somebody who isn't really feeling that camera bump, you are gonna kind of minimize that a bit and you still keep the stability of resting the phone on the back. And what you like you guys were just saying, actually, with the case on it, you still get the ridge on the bottom. So you kind of still get that place to press your finger, even though it's not as slippery with the uh, the case on. So it's really nice. But what do you think about the, because I know people have made an issue of this, some folk, the, the curved edges, the curved edges on the Pixel 6 Pro. It doesn't really bother me. Yeah, I mean... I, in general, I'm more of a fan of the flat edge versus the the curved edge. Mm -hmm. Would I prefer for it to be flat? It's that's just where I am right now. Like I've I've, I've like gone full circle. I was you know when it when everything was flat and then suddenly there were curves. I was like, oh, I want the curves. And then I had like a couple of years of really loving the curves. And then I then I kind of came back around and I'm back on the flat. I mean, it doesn't bug me. I think part of the reason is because I've spent the majority of my time with the device with it inside of a case. And inside right. of a case, you just I mean, you just really don't detect the curve nearly as much, right? I've got I've got the edge there. Um, I'm not having any of those like you know accidents dental bumps on the side because the case is kind of taking taking that up so well, um and we're so not i guess to that end it doesn't it. bug me as much yeah we're not using a pin with it so like yeah. that's one of the things that kind of irks me with the note a little bit is when you're writing when you're doing things close to the edge you kind of slip off you know because of the curved edge i much uh, i prefer a flat edge i think with uh, uh pin input but with this one, since you're not utilizing it in that that fashion, really not a bother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no question. I mean, the quality of the display is great. It's a super yeah. sharp, you know, visually, it's a sharp looking OLED. The 120 hertz, uh, the smoothness of the of the refresh. I mean, and realizing that that ramps up and down depending on what you're doing. But um, you know, at this point, I'm just I'm so accustomed to those higher refresh rates. So it's nice to see it on the Pixel. Um, really, not a whole lot to say about the display other than yes, it's really great. <laughs> you're not yeah, gonna be yeah. you're not gonna get this and go, oh, the display doesn't look very good. You're gonna like it. Oh no, it's and, and it's the the I think the have, having both the Pro and the 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 standard the six. The one thing that I really like about the Pro is the dynamic range with uh, movie content is just really beautiful and it handles blacks uh, excellently. Like even the 13 Pro Max. So one of my test videos and one of the things I do when I review uh, products is I always use the same visual content. So I have for night uh, video, night uh, photos, I have a metro stop that I always take pictures at because it has palm trees and palm fronds and those nice. things are just a muddled mess when a camera has poor night sight or night photos. Um, and then for my videos, I always use uh, The Witcher uh, and then this one hip hop cartoon that I found on YouTube and uh, a, a movie, a show called Our Planet on Netflix. But with The Witcher uh, specifically, there are scenes in episode four where a character named Yasie uh, is talking to The Witcher while he's sitting in this, this bathtub. And a couple times, Yasie backs into the shadows. And when he backs into the shadows um, on poorer displays, uh, the shadows have grain in them you kind of lose Yasie a bit, but on this display, his skin tone is is excellent. The blacks are are black. There's no grain, and and, and the nuance in his skin tone and his clothing, because he's kind of peachy. The shirt he's wearing is this kind of cream, and and you can see the the layers, the colors, the the range of colors between. Uh, his skin tone and his clothes, even when he's well into the shadows. And so the the dynamic range on this display is really good. And like I said, on the 13 Pro Max, when those shadows, you get some noise. They're not black, black. And and, right. and so I've been I've been pretty impressed with the display indoors. Outdoors. Yeah. Not not as much of that lift, not as much of that yeah. that brightness. It, yeah, it could use some. It could use a few more nits outdoors. 
Yeah, I, I've had a hard time judging that because it's been, uh, I mean, it's been raining so much here in the Bay Area, so it's been a very oh. overcast week for us, so I haven't had as much of that direct sunlight to uh, to compare that against. Uh, Performance-wise, things have felt pretty snappy. Like, it, this is this is a hard one for me because, you know, realizing that there's the Tensor chip inside mm-hmm. um, and not having a direct comparison other than other flagship devices sure, running right. Qualcomm processors, and it's very, right. like, I'm not... I'm not a benchmark kind of guy. I'm just like, I'm going to use the phone. And if I notice these slowdowns or whatever, I will call them out. And I noticed, you know, a handful of times where things got a little confused, you know, uh, maybe it's the, the fact that I'm on the lock screen and I'm trying to use the, you know, the, the ambient mode is on and I'm trying to use the fingerprint sensor and it's taken a while to like wake up and actually kick over to the mm-hmm. fingerprint sensor. Had that happen a couple of times, little random things like that. Um, some, some of the, the processing that's happening inside of the camera app, depending on what I'm doing, would like s- like stop things in their tracks for a second and I couldn't actually mm-hmm. back out or do anything. It's like I was mm-hmm. locked in there until that process finalized. Little things like that, but in everyday use, didn't really notice anything that, that gave me any sort of concern, especially not in the this the very standard, you know, rigid um, aspects of Android that we're all accustomed to interacting with 90% of the time. Um, nothing stood out for me there. I'm sure there will be people that, you know, can can produce the deeper details on, on uh, <laughs> you know, uh, as far as that stuff is concerned. But from a subjective perspective, I've been pretty happy with how it performs. I think that, you know, it has ample, ample amount of memory in there to uh, to tag on to the the tensor chip and I like what Google does with their AI on device so if this chip is enabling a lot of that stuff I'm I'm for it it, it seems to work well for me yeah and and I think ultimately we're we're playing with a device that is young you know it's going to yeah. mature there are going to be software updates uh, some of the things some of the behaviors we see now. Uh, may change over time as as they work out some bugs here and there, as they uh, get people on their support forums who discover various things. So I have definitely been uh, happy with this. One of the things that for me, my daily driver on the Android side of things is the Note 20 Ultra. And for a lot of phones, I actually review and test them and then I almost can't wait to get back home to get back onto my Note 20 Ultra. Yeah, but right, with, right. <laughs> but with this phone, I actually am like, okay, I'm actually cool. I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna sit on this one for a while because uh, I'm really I'm really enjoying using it to the point yeah. where I'm not like eager to get back onto the Note 20. I know exactly what you mean. Your home device, you know, especially yeah. as, you know, as people who review a lot of devices that I'm always looking to get back to my home device. And when I'm not, then I know that the device that I'm reviewing is actually something really special. Um, yep. It just so happens that the six is, is going to be my home device. Like, I'm, like I'm all, my home device is always the latest pixel is just what it has been for the last <laughs> six years. So that's just the way it goes. Um cameras uh we got to talk about the cameras uh obviously that is a really big aspect of well i mean when you take the six and then you take the six pro and and the three hundred dollars ish difference between the two you know there are a handful of features that set the six pro in a different you know feature category than the six camera i would say is potentially right at the top of that list you know that having that extra the four x um the the four x optical zoom in there it really, for for me, that's that's one of my favorite lens options is to have an actual optical zoom at mm-hmm. my disposal. I just find that to be the one of the most useful lenses. You know, sure, an ultra wide looks really great, and there are certain scenes and scenarios where it's really nice to have an ultra wide. But I'm going to use a four x optical zoom way more than I'm going to use an ultra wide. Um, and so I love that Google has the four the the actual. 4x hardware in here and that it is an optical zoom and not you know not using their their ai to enhance and make a a Mm. better looking digital zoom which is nice but it's not as good let's be honest but why on earth does this phone not lock you into the optical 4x i had so many times where i would take pictures and Mm. i'd go to 4x and I'd look at it later and be like, okay, that's a digital zoom. No question about it. That is a digital zoom. I can see that crunchiness. And that's not. That looks like 
an actual optical zoom. And I've actually noticed when I'm using the camera hardware, depending on what I have in focus, the the software is switching from one camera to another. So it's like I'm in 4X mode and in one hand, in, in one scenario, it feels like it needs to be doing it digitally. And then another one, it feels like it needs to do it optically or uh, yeah, through the optical lens. There's no way for me to set it and say, always do optical at 4X. Why? Right. Did you have that problem? It, uh, I didn't notice that as much because so when I was playing with the zoom factor, I was I was um, uh, pinching a lot and going directly into uh, the 4X and I didn't notice it switch back to the uh, uh, I didn't know I didn't notice it switch to a digital uh, zoom from the main lens instead of the telephoto. So yeah. I didn't I didn't quite have that same experience, but the the thing that I did experience, which which kind of confounded me a bit, was um, the macro, and and mm, I know yeah. there were a ton of reviews where they were like, and you know Google made a huge misstep here. There's no macro mode on this phone, and it has me second guessing myself because I took a bunch of macro photos with the telephoto lens. And yeah. you know, with the with the modern with modern smartphones, when you go in moving close to an object, you see that lens shift to uh, macro. And I saw that happen every time I moved in close to an object with the telephoto lens. So when people are saying there's no macro mode on this phone, and I was getting some beautiful macros, I had this macro of something that I erroneously called a B, which everybody in the comments section of my YouTube review was happy to let me know that that was not in fact a B because there was no stinger. And that shows you how good the macro was. That off my <laughs> YouTube video, people were like, there's no stinger on that. I got that close to this fly. And that's so, crazy. That's crazy. It, yeah. They're, yeah. they're pointing this out and I'm thinking you didn't stop for a second and think that this photo was sharp enough and close enough that you could tell there was no stinger on this bee. And you're yeah. complaining about the fact I called it a bee. Yeah, so, indeed. Definitely I, impressed. Uh, I'm impressed. Yeah, I, I love a good macro camera, I, you know, and granted, macro is not the kind of lens that you use every single day, but I love having one. And mm -hmm. it took me a while to realize that the 4X was the one that you use if you want to do a macro shot. I don't know if you have a, my, my photo roll uh, loaded up, Burke, but if you go in there and refresh, because I just added a couple of shots to it, just hit the refresh and you'll see down at the bottom of there, uh, a bottom of that list, you'll see a couple of, uh, you know, close up photos of like a USB thing, yeah, USB. Oh, plug yeah. you know and uh yeah. you know and a the couple texture of on that is beautiful yeah totally and that's what the 4x you do uh like you said in your review you do have to kind of back away from the object in order to get that close up because if you do get too close and you have the 4x optical on it does go out of focus so you got to right. find that sweet spot but as you pointed out in your review that allows you to get a nice macro shot without your shadow kind of interfering with the object you know on like a one plus nine or whatever that that had the macro lens that I actually really liked a lot you had to get so close to the object and sometimes that can interfere with the kind of shot that you're actually taking depending on where the light light is coming from so yeah, or, or in my case you know risk getting stung by something that isn't <laughs> yeah true <laughs> very I, true i do like i do like the pixelception going on with jason taking up close macro photos of a pixel 6 with <laughs> yes. a pixel 6 pro it goes deep. i do like that yes. yeah <laughs> dun, dun, dun. into the metaverse no, but seriously the, the, but but looking at these photos jason these look like those ultra macro up close professional kind of shots you see yeah like the, the texture on that usb key and like the the, yeah. the, the, the the third shot or this the second shot of the pixel that we saw the red one you know, just looked so crisp and it's like hard to believe they're getting that from a phone. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, you also called out and, and made, uh, well, you, during the announcement and then later in your review, you pointed out Google's, um, announcement around real tone, which mm -hmm. I was 
from my from my own perspective, I was really happy Google actually made made this a part of its presentation. Uh, when we were doing live live coverage, you know, Leo had, had been like, you know, Apple's probably working on this too, but Apple didn't call it out. I'm like, well, I'm really happy that Google did call this out because now everybody can kind of hold their feet to the fire and say, okay, we know you're working on this and we know that you're proud of it. So do better, improve it. Right. What has been your perspective because I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, typical average white guy. Like, like it's, it's impossible for me to like test, test this out and know how Google is doing with making their camera more inclusive. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I think in, in order for people to understand this, because I have seen some comments. Uh, fortunately, I actually haven't seen any because. Uh, I actually do take some time and and look through comments on on my YouTube um, videos, and and I did look through some of the comments on directly on AndroidCentral.com, and there was one person or a couple people in particular who went into their whole anti woke tirade, and and I think it's because I, I did have somebody who um, questioned me on Twitter about the whole skin tone thing and racism and, and all these these topics. And when I told them what it was really about, they came back and said, oh, okay, now I get it. Thank you for explaining. And so what people need to understand is that in, in a Western culture in, in America, a lot of the things in America, and this is not a racism or race issue uh, specifically, but because of the way uh, uh, Western culture was early on, pretty much everything from our medicine to our IQ tests, um, all these things were based on uh, middle-aged white males. So in the film industry and in television industry and in photography industry, a lot of things were based on a Eurocentric standard. And, and in this case for photography, there was something, and you guys can Google this who are listening, uh, watching the Shirley card. Look up the Shirley card. And so that's how they used to white balance and control exposure. And it was based on a, a white woman, a Caucasian woman. And so cameras uh, for so long, uh, their mm. color science, how they white balance, how they auto expose has been based on a paler uh, skin tone, which leaves people who look like me out. And, and, and furthermore, um, because television in its early days, uh, uh, and again, me coming from a broadcast background, my father is actually an editor. Um, he was uh, uh, a post-production editor and has worked on Sons of Anarchy and Smallville and top uh, number one shows. So I, I'm, I kind of know a little bit about this. And, 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 and so one of the things that we used to lament as, as black people in America early on in, in television's history is a lot of times you'd have makeup artists or cinematographers who didn't know how to light scenes for our skin tone, who mm. would favor the white actors uh, for lighting. Uh, one of the most egregious cases of this in, in a pop culture reference was there was a movie out years ago called Money Train with Wesley Snipes and Jennifer Lopez. And then if you look at the movie posters for that, it's an image of Wesley Snipes' hand. I think it was against Jennifer Lopez's face, maybe? And, and like caressing her and his hand just looked 30 shades darker than he already is. And he's already a dark brother. And it was because they lit that for her and not him. And so we have this history of cinema and photographic products that are geared more towards white people than people who have a darker skin tone. And so now Google and and I think some of this also probably happens, like you said, they didn't call it out with Apple with Deep Fusion and some of the things they're doing with how they're approaching um, their camera's AI when it comes to low light and texture and, and colors. But in this case, Real Tone, they specifically made it a point to say, um, we are uh, expanding our database, our AI database, uh, so that we're training our AI, we're training that, that, using that machine learning to actually look at your tones and, 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 and correct and adjust auto exposure and auto white balancing for individuals' tones in a shot. And, and cause it's not good enough to just say, well, we're harsh. going to do brown skin. You know, there's, there's so many shades of brown. And I mean, just in skin in general, from, from your most, from your Icelandic to your sub-Saharan, you know, there's, there's thousands, millions of, of, of shades 
So having Absolutely. a camera that can account for that that beautiful broad variety in our humanity is is it's about time. Yeah, and, and in your experience, play, you know, playing around with a camera and taking the pictures mm -hmm. that you did, like, do you do you feel like the images better represented? your true self like your true oh, skin tone compared to other phones that you've used absolutely so one of the things you can see in in, in my review there were, i have a buddy and I, I i went to him at work one day and i said hey i have this new phone uh, I, I want you to come outside with me and take uh, some photos with me so i'm kind of a a, a caramel skin tone and he's a, a darker brown skin tone and so with the Pixel 5, and that's what I compared it against uh, in this case, is I compared the Pixel 5, and yeah, it's that image there. So on the right, uh, people who haven't had to deal with this, they're not generally going to notice these things, but the right photo is the Hershey bar effect. We are two different shades of brown, but in the right photo, we look the same shade. We're pretty mm -hmm. much the same shade in that photo. But if you look in the left photo, you can see my brown is not as saturated as it is on the right. It's dialed back a bit. And you can see on, on him on the left, his tone, his shade of brown is actually different than mine. And so, again, on the right, we're the same shade left, different shades. And, and so that's what I'm seeing is that it is actually uh, uh, picking that up and exposing properly so that you're able to see that nuance in our shades. And and again, for somebody or bodies who've never had to watch TV shows and you're watching another black person on the show and going, that makeup artist did not know how to uh, uh, color that person or that cinematographer didn't know how to light, you know, this black actor who's standing around other actors of lighter shades. And, and so if you've right. never had to deal with that, this is a big deal. This is this is a, this is a big deal. Yeah, and Google calling it out and making it, you know, making it publicly a, a part of yeah. what they're focusing on and just kind of naming it. I thought it was, was was really good. Thank you for sharing all that, by the way, Absolutely. and thank you for awesome. for you know including that. Oh, so I can't make that call. Thank thank you so much, Google. Google just really wants to get on the show right now. It's, they're trying to be on the show now at this point. Like they're, they're like, all right, they won't book us. Maybe we can go through the assistant. Like that's the Google that's really plan. wanted. Yeah, really wanted to get on here and like bat, take a bow and be like, well, you're Exactly, welcome. that's what it was, yeah. Okay, real quick, because we, we've gone a little long in this segment, but I have to add this last block here because... Uh, there, you know, there are a number of features we have. Uh, obviously, there's a lot that we haven't touched on on the on the six Pro. Everyone should check check out Tashaka's uh, full review on, on Android Central. Of course, if you want to get detailed on certain aspects of it, um, and more more than we're going to get to today. But I wanted to talk a little bit about fences because. You know, remember back in, was it Google I.O. 2017, Google showed off on the stage a picture of a, of a boy, a, a baseball, you know, in a baseball field yeah. uh, behind, you know, behind a chain link fence. And they said, you know, and they alluded the to the fact that coming soon, there would be this magic ability to remove the chain link fence. And I mean, it was yes. one of those moments at Google I.O. where everyone went, ooh, and ah, and we all wanted it. And so now we have Magic Eraser. It's a feature mm -hmm. that's part of the camera of the 6 and the 6 Pro. And I thought, I'm going to actually attempt this. So I took the photo that Google presented with the chain link fence. And Burke, if you hit that video, mm -hmm. you can see my process of using the Magic Eraser and removing all of the things, all of the pieces to oh, it. Of course, cool. I... I sped it up to see. I wanted to see how close we could get to the original using this feature. Now, mind you, Google did not say <laughs> Magic Eraser is the feature that will remove chain link fences from your photos. <laughs> they didn't actually explicitly say that. But it's pretty obvious that that's what this feature, you know, that's that's what led to this feature. And so yeah. I, I went through the process of doing that. And then, uh, Burke, if you skip forward to the before photo that we have in there. And we can see, I and mean, we can see eventually side by side. I have, I have kind of what it looked like uh, when Google did it, and what it looked like when I did it. And there you go. So on the left is the Google I/O 2017 
<laughs> looks a little bit sharper, not going to lie, on the right, the Pixel 6 Pro 2021, which, I mean, at the end of the day, I was still able to remove the fence, so it's yeah. like the fence isn't there anymore. It doesn't look horrible, but it's not perfect. It's not ideal. It's also not at all what, what Google promised, you know, that this feature could actually do. So, But I guess to that end, kind of impressive that it could even do that. I, I think what I noticed in using that feature is it's really easy to do the draw on screen, wait mm -hmm. a second. I mean, not even a second. It does the processing really fast, which is a testament to the Tensor chip uh, on yeah. the inside of the phone. But I pulled the Chainlink Fence image into Photoshop, and I am no Photoshop genius whatsoever. But mm -hmm. I started, because I was going to like do it in Photoshop and show what it looks like when you use real tools. And <laughs> it took me so long well, you, you to gotta get know through what you're a small doing there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. But I was using the tools that I know how to do that with. And it took me long enough to where I realized it just wasn't worth my time. It mm. may end up looking better in the end. But the point that I realized is that it takes so much more time, unless you truly know what you're doing, I suppose. But to do it with the tools versus Google's version where you're literally just drawing with your finger and boop, it does it smartly. Yeah. So it, it's it's um you know, that was one of the, the kind of the hits of the review is uh, I'm, I removed two large dumpsters from a baseball field and people seem to be amused by that. Um, and, and it was clean, it, it, you know, and I just drew a big circle around each dumpster and they were gone. No shadow. Uh, it, it was it was it's impressive. And I think ultimately when when Google's talking tensor, that's what tensor is really about is. Uh, creating a technology that allows people to just use the device and use the tool without honestly having to know the tools, know those professional tools. It's like, um, you know, people who want to use a computer, but they don't really want to know exactly how it works. They just want to turn it on and it works. And, and and that's where we're at with, I think, with this Tensor technology and, and with AI and ML is that, uh, manufacturers, uh, the Apples, the Googles of the world, the Samsungs, they're creating experiences that allow people to just use the tools without having a deep understanding of the healing tool and 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 removing yeah. backgrounds and doing all those things. They, they just draw a circle around something and you're done. And, and right. you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Um, you know, some folks, well, Burke and the, and the and other people in chat are pointing out uh, that you do still see remnants of the oh, fence. Yeah. You know, in in my removal, it's it's not so magic that it's going to you know remove it entirely. What I noticed is when you're doing this on things with a lot of texture, like if mm -hmm. I was removing the fence and there was grass behind there, it would mm -hmm. remove the grass, but it still yeah. ends up being kind of more of a smear than it is a texture kind of replacement. And right. so these things aren't perfect, but I actually, I actually did a bunch of fence removals. I was like inspired today. So I, you know, put my dog behind a fence. I was like, well, what if my dog, I went to the tennis, the tennis court down the street Jeez. and uh, there was just a random guy there. I'm like, Hey, can I take a photo of you <laughs> and then try and remove the fence? And oh, I mean, wow. it didn't work that well. I mean, that's the before and after, but anyways, did you, so, do you know this per do you know this person no, playing tennis or no. no? Okay, cool. No, I didn't. And that actually worked out well with my dog. I mean, you can yeah. see, like you, like I said, you, you see can it. see that like yeah. fuziness of the fence is still kind of there. But I mean, but here's know, the thing: we're looking at this there. on a larger screen. Yeah, you know, totally. when people are doing this on their phones, it's going to be a lot harder to see that that nuance on your smaller smartphone screen. Yeah. Where where True. you can kind of see the fences still left there, and and I think because we're we're you know geeky and nerdy and and you know uh, to put it colloquially we're about that life. Um, yep. We tend to really pick up and be sensitive to things that I think the general public isn't. You know, it, it's like getting somebody who's not an audiophile to listen to and hear for things that an audiophile hears. A lot of totally. people just want to listen to music. You know, and they don't know the difference between an MP3 and a FLAC file until you put something in front of them or over their ears that allows them to really hear the difference between an MP3 and a FLAC file. Yeah, yeah, indeed, no question. Um, 
cool stuff. We could we could talk about this all day. We have a lot <laughs> yeah. of other stuff to talk about. Uh, so again. I'll just point everybody to Tashaka's uh, review on Android Central. This is like a taste of his review and, you know, and some of my thoughts. I'm sure I'll have more thoughts to share over the coming weeks. But real quickly before we move on to Shaka, Jason, real quick, Pixel 6 Pro, thumbs up, thumbs down. I. Yeah, thumbs up, I mean, two thumbs up, I, two thumbs. I, all right, all right. I don't know you how you give, how you give it a thumbs down. Like it really, if, you know, if you especially had to with the a, cost. Oh, sorry. If you had to give, if you had to give it a letter grade, how about that? Oh, old high school classic. Is this an A phone? Is this a B? I feel plus? like it's an A phone. Yeah, I feel like it's an wow. A phone. Um, you know, I don't know that it's uh, an A plus or an A. I'd give it like an A minus. I feel like it's it's like it's like B plus A minus category. Area, right, I'm, right I'm kind of in the B, B plus. And because I think the thing for me, and it's, I think it's going to depend on where you live. Living here in Southern California, my wife is a mermaid. She loves being at the beach. Like that's her, the ocean calms, it's, it's her thing. And so I spend a lot of time at the beach and and the, the readability of this display in direct cloudless sunlight I think that that is the, the, the thing that drops at a grade for me. And and the right. one thing that I did notice, and we'll see if this is fixed with the software update, is the fingerprint scanner freaks out in direct sunlight. It it oh. it, it errors out so interesting. much. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I have yeah, thoughts well, about I mean, the fingerprint scanner that I will tell next week when we talk about the six. The, the <laughs> good, six, good. We can because we didn't. Uh, we hardly even touched yeah. on that, and I would say that's ah, that's one of my iffy parts. But you yeah. hardly touched on it, Jason. <laughs> oh, ha. Theater, ha. Dang it. Dang there it. I go. wish Good I meant job. to do that. <laughs> All right. So, so, B plus A minus, I feel like, is the, yeah. is, is where you're averaging out. All right. That's a pretty good grade. Yeah. So. All right, so that said, let's take a break and thank our first sponsor because this show is brought to you by AT&T Active Armor. And listen, I mean, clearly we can all relate to the fact that we rely so much on our phones these days. I call them pocket computers that are also phones, right? But we're always on them, whether it's live streaming content or catching up with your family on weekly or daily video calls, if you're like my family at all, um, or watching or listening to your favorite podcast. But guess what? There is no room for fraud calls. Um, and in fact, like, you know, I, you know, it's at the point now where I sit on the couch, I'm watching TV, I have my phone in my pocket, or my phone next to me, a commercial comes on, you're looking something up. You know, the last thing I want is to get interrupted by a fraud call, like at all, ever, right? Um, and these days, with so few phone calls I actually get, it, the, the, nerv the nervousness that the person actually calling me is a fraud call or not, can I answer the phone or not, that, that fear I have where I find myself just not answering the phone and then I'm missing on phone calls from people that I actually care about or that I like, um, and it's just not a good situation. So thankfully, AT&T is making customer security a priority and helping block those pesky calls. Uh, it's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor is 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to stop threats. And what's even better, it's at no extra charge. Uh, so compatible device and services required, of course. Visit att.com slash active armor for details. And thank you, AT&T, for protecting us from those pesky fraudulent calls. Thanks, AT&T. Thank you, AT&T, and thank you to Burke, who has his fingers on the news bumper. It's time for the other news. That's right. Vindication. Yes, the things I was complaining about in Android news. Oh, and goats, <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> Were you complaining about the quick settings panel at some point? I'm trying to remember. Yes. Uh, it's like the literally the all first the thing, like the second I... I installed Android 12. I, I hopped into the Slack. Spent an hour on Slack just yelling at me about it. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> but, that's, um, right, that's right. That's right. Uh, but yeah, so so uh, users like Burke of Android 12 have discovered the new internet tile in Quick Settings, um, which used to be easy to toggle Wi-Fi and mobile internet side by side in Quick Settings. Now both functions are found inside the internet tile, requiring an extra interaction. Uh, Google is standing by this decision, decision, citing its user studies, said that users often turn off Wi-Fi to force mobile internet, but then forget to turn Wi-Fi back on, which is what users are you looking at? Um, with these changes, instead of deactivating Wi-Fi to do this, the user only has to tap their carrier to prioritize it tempor temporarily. Google also said an upcoming feature drop will bring those functions to the lock screen without requiring authentication. 
Um, so have you, either of you guys ran into this? Have you tried to switch from Wi-Fi to mobile data and had to go through the extra interaction at, at this point or? I mean, yes. I, I, yes, absolutely. I have run into many situations prior to this change where I did need to deactivate Wi-Fi in order for, you know, the mobile, mobile internet to be the primary. And I don't know if I forgot to activate Wi-Fi again. I can kind of see where they're coming from. Um, th here's the thing that I feel about this is like I had no idea why they made this change until I read this article. And it's almost like and, and Google's response. It's almost like Google assumes that everybody just knows that if you tap the carrier in this area, it automatically like prioritizes the carrier connection over Wi-Fi without disabling Wi-Fi. Like now that I understand it, I'll actually use it, but I'm like an Android nerd and I never understood that until just now. How is anyone else gonna understand that? But uh, Tushaka, what's been your experience with this sort of thing? Uh, you know, when I was playing with the beta and uh, those extra interactions uh, came up, yeah, I I I, I kind of liked having the Wi-Fi uh, on its own because I could just tap that, turn it off, turn it on, and there, I I don't know about the whole forgetting thing because uh, there are times when like you know I'll be at work and I want to get to something real quick and the 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 cell signal isn't that strong, so I'll pop into the Wi-Fi real quick, do what I need to do, turn it back off. And then when I get home, I want to be on our, our home Wi-Fi. So I'll just pop the Wi-Fi on uh, back on my phone at home. So having everything integrated into that one tile for me is a little bit of an uh, uh, excess steps, hashtag first world problems. But, totally. um, <laughs> yeah. but you know, I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it, I, I think it is nicer to have the Wi-Fi solo and just to be able to turn it on and turn it off as I needed to. Because one of the things that always annoyed me about uh, some of the Samsung devices is that auto Wi-Fi, where it automatically just tries to join networks. And I remember when that first they first did that, you'd be driving down the street and your phone's trying to connect to everybody's Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah, to. right. Oh, God, that was so annoying. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm good. I'm good with the manual single tile, single focus tile, just Wi-Fi only uh, clip it from there. Yeah. Yeah. Google, Google tries to simplify things. Uh, and I, I think sometimes when they try and simplify things, they make other things more complicated. I mean, it's and it's a similar story to the, you know, the, the device controls moving into the quick settings as opposed to the power menu and, and on the lock screen. Like all I like. I realize that the, those uh, those home uh, home device controls are now on the lock screen where they used to be in the power menu, and I realize that that should make things just as easy. I should just tap that on the lock screen or whatever, and I don't know if it's just like my not my habit yet or what, but I do know that I interact with my home uh, my my smart home controls less now, like. Definitely, I interact with them less now than I did when they were available in my power menu. And yeah. so I'm just, I'm not using it as much. Maybe I just don't need to use it as much. Or maybe like, like there, there's some mental barrier there that I haven't gotten it, over. <laughs> or some sort of like prox proximity to access or something like that. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, right. Because cause I, feel, I feel like, and I, I run into this in my day job all the time, is like whenever a decision is made and the, the reasoning is user testing, it's like you can't question that. Because we did user testing and we found right. this, but like, oh, yeah. like <laughs> yes. but for the same for the same reason, you did, th that's the same logic where like a great TV show gets canceled because it didn't get high Nielsen ratings. You know, yeah. like it's it, it, that's a sample size that you and I and by, by all means you cannot. It's impossible to adjust these OS settings to you know be customized to every user to be perfect for every user. There are choices you need to make and things like that. But it, it just it just seems like sometimes it's, it's a flip of the coin and they're just choosing the wrong direction, at least for us as power users. I will say I will share Burke's frustration because now I upgraded my Pixel 4a to Android 12 on day, you know, like uh, right after we did the show last week, actually. And so I've been on Android 12 on the release version for the first time for this whole week. And I got to say my biggest like I'm fine with the bulbous, you know, you know, changes, the design changes and all that sort of stuff. The biggest thing that's got me is the swipe down quick settings menu that takes the whole pain. Mm -hmm. Like it, it used to be, 
<laughs> Thank you, Burke. Thank you. It used to be it used to be that you pulled it down and you could interact what you need to, and it went back up, and it didn't take up the whole screen. But what I find myself doing is swiping down. It goes the whole screen, and then bringing it back up to give me more. Like it, it, something feels wrong about that entire interaction right now. Um, huh. Yeah, because like because I'm not like you, Jason. I. I, I look at every notification and swipe it away. I don't have yeah. a screen worth of notifications. So what happens is, is that I swipe it down and there's the one notification and then there's 75% of white space on the screen. Right. It just seems right. odd. So Yeah. Not a good use a, of space for sure. Not a good use of space. And I'm one of those really weird guys who never hated uh, the early versions. And, and I'm drawing a blank right now. The early versions of One UI, Samsung's, Earlier, earlier, uh, touch whiz, uh, touch whiz, oh, touch whiz. Yeah, I'm one of those weird people that never like abhorred touch whiz, like I've heard so many people do. So, the larger yeah. uh, design elements, uh, in material you, uh, they haven't been an annoyance for me. And I think with the um, with the home control thing, I actually rarely ever interact with that, but that's for me based on an experience I had trying to control my home and not the home control devices. When I first started getting all these home automation devices in, in the house, you know, I'm, I'm geeking out, I'm nerding out. I'm like, oh, honey, you've got to try this. Check this out. I can turn a light off with my smartphone. And she's just like, yay. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, great. Yeah, yeah. And, and so <laughs> I couldn't get my wife to use it. I couldn't get my children to use it. Nobody would turn things on and off with their smartphones. They would just go to the switch and do it because it was easier for them until voice assistants came along. Yeah. Once we got an, oh, I'm sorry. I'll forget that in my reviews too. I'm always tripping off people's devices. I'll get it's better. Hard. It's hard. It's hard to remember people. it all. It's all good. <laughs> But once we got voice assistants, then everybody in my home started using all the uh, or most of the automated stuff because it's a natural interaction to just invoke the assistant's name and say, turn off the living room light, turn off the, yeah. you know, so, so I, I, and that for me is a, a really a non-issue because I just don't interact with it on the phone as, as much. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. What else do we have? Oh, so this is this is kind of quick, but um, those of you who watch or listen to the show may or may not realize that the Oculus Go and the Oculus Quest and the Quest 2 are all based on Android. We haven't really talked about it much on this show because it's not like Android in the way that we use our smartphones. But it is notable that, you know, one of the most popular VR platforms on the market right now is run uh, is running Android underneath. So Oculus Go was the Oculus b before Quest was a thing. Oculus Go was like the step up from smartphone VR where you would put a, a smartphone in, you know, like a gear VR from Samsung. It was like the next generation of that instead of putting a phone in there. It was just a goggle, but it was a goggle with some uh, some uh, degrees of freedom, so you could do some movement and have your position in VR shift around. It came with a single touch controller, which isn't like a a full blown Oculus controller, but it's kind of like a uh, more like a mouse pad on a stick sort of thing. And last year, or was it earlier this year? No, it was last year. Uh, Facebook announced that the Oculus Go was going to be uh, was going to be all over. They were they weren't going to be supporting it anymore. And uh, it was discontinued. Well, now I just thought it was good to, to mention this because I would love to see more manufacturers do this with, with hardware that they no longer support. Uh, they have officially given instructions and the ability for anyone who has an Oculus Go headset to free it of the reins of the software and mm -hmm. unlock the device, which ultimately opens the door for, you know, whoever owns these devices. I have one at the studio. I don't have it here with me. But if you own one of these devices, that allows you to continue using it. It's not suddenly a dead device like, I don't know, the Nexus Q, for example. <laughs> um so, so I just think that's a good, that's a good trend. Um, I'm happy that they did that. I don't know, you know, what that means as far as like what you're going to be able to do with it. Once you unlock the device, um, if someone's going to create, you know, some, some cool experiences for it or new, um, new software to do things that you couldn't do it on initially, all that is possible at this point. And that's kind of the point is that by unlocking, by giving 
users and owners of this device the tools to unlock the device, then it gives it new life instead of being, you know, ending up in a landfill or on a Hall of Fame wall, which it probably wasn't. It's not really a Hall of Fame device, in my opinion. But there you go. I thought that was neat. I wanted to point that out because I, I want to see more of that. I think that's important. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, and especially when you spent your hard earned money on something and it's end of life and yeah. you, okay, well, I'm just going to throw this in a drawer. Uh, now you, you have, you know, the potential for a thriving uh, DIY community to rise up and, and, and maybe extend the functionality and the usability of that device, you know, well into the future, if enough people uh, are, are enthusiastic uh, about the device. Yeah, you know there are enough enthu there there's at least one enthusiast out there that's like, oh, I know exactly what I'm gonna do with the Oculus <laughs> exactly. Go now. You know? <laughs> and if there's I'm one, there's probably Skynet. a number of them. So there's yeah. a, there's enough of a community that there's gonna be something cool done with it. And I'm oh, curious yeah. to see what that is, but I think that's a good direction to go on old outdated hardware. Absolutely. All right. Well, we got one more little bit of news here. Um, so we remember it was like the parade of announcements between Apple and Google. But do you remember oh, yeah. Samsung had an event, actually, if yeah. you recall this? Uh, the <laughs> Unpacked, Unpacked Part 2 happened last week. Um, yeah. and, it, and it was really all about fashion and style. Um, so first, <laughs> you can now customize the Galaxy Z Flip 3. Um, it's the magical bespoke edition. Um, and basically, it, which is ironic, I love this. It's basically Moto Maker for the Z Flip 3. Uh, for those of you who remember Moto Maker. Um, yes, indeed. So you got pink, pink, white, black, blue, and yellow options for the front and uh, ba back glass panels. Um, you can get a black or silver frame. Uh, comes to a grand total, if you, those of you who do the math, a total of 49 possible combinations. Um, and it starts at $1099.99. So that's one thousand dollars and nine one thousand nine one thousand ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents, and includes twelve months of Samsung Care Plus protection. Um, and also, Buds Two and Watch Four come in Mason Katsune models, uh, bands, watch faces, and imprinted designs. So for those of you who are living the Samsung lifestyle, this is a way to bling up your device. And here's the thing. There's totally a market for this. I do not blame them at all for doing this. People eat this stuff up, especially um, you know with with such an innovative phone like the Z Flip Three, um, and also with the with you know with the with the branding there on the on the watch bands and the Pixel Buds, um, especially with a with a designer like Mason Katsun. Um, you know, it's it, it, this this while we might scoff at this, I I know exactly why this gets greenlit, and I don't blame them. So. <laughs> Holding a, a, an event uh, during event week for something like this, a little ridiculous, not going to lie. But I think you're right. I mean, Moto Maker was, you remember how cool that was? <laughs> like, that was, was very awesome. Cool. It was very cool. Mo Moto Maker was a really cool um, feature or, of Motorola's phones. Back when Motorola phones were probably, in my opinion, the, the pinnacle of their coolness, you know, they were, that was right when, you know, Motorola and Google were really connected together uh, in, in some really interesting ways on the hardware and the software was, was unique oh, yeah. and everything. And Moto Maker, just as a feature of that device made, I mean, my wife got a, a you know, a device through Moto Maker. She loved the, the possibility of, of customizing. I think she actually ended up getting two devices through it. So, um, so I don't, I don't, uh, you know, more power to you, Samsung. I, I would love to see this on more devices. I just don't know how necessary it was to have like an unpacked two event about it. That's well, probably it was, why I didn't even watch the event, but it was them doing me too. It was like, okay, yeah. look, you know, Apple's doing this and that. What about um, us? You know, yeah. What about exactly? It was just a way to get in the news a little bit and yeah. timing wise, you know, like if they did it before all that, it would get forgotten. So they do it after and hope that they get some pickup. I get it. I get the, I get the yeah. logic, but whatever. Yeah. The funniest hot <laughs> take I saw on that was somebody said, this could have been an email. Yeah. <laughs> well, true. It, it, it really true. could have been. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to argue that one one bit. All <laughs> right. Let's, uh, let's take a quick break here and thank the sponsor. And then we will get into, I think next up we have some app news that we've got to talk about. But first, this episode of All About Android is brought to you by UserWay.org. UserWay is just 
it's super cool. It's all about accessibility. And we talk about accessibility on this show uh, as much as we can to, sh to kind of shine a light on the importance of building products and building software that is accessible to everyone. Every website, without exception, needs to be accessible. It's a public entity. And, you know, not to mention it's the right thing to do. UserWay has an awesome AI powered solution. It tirelessly enforces the hundreds of WCAG guidelines, and all you need is just a single line of JavaScript. And with that, UserWay can achieve more than an entire team of developers. It's actually pretty cool. It's kind of magical. It makes your website accessible uh, in ways that otherwise could be very overwhelming. But UserWay's solution, uh, like I said, it makes it super simple. It's cost effective. You can actually check out, they have a, a free scanning tool that you can use to see if your website is ADA compliant. That's a great place to start. You can do the scan. You can see what's going on and go from there. UserWay's AI and machine learning solutions power accessibility for over 1 million websites. It's trusted uh, by the biggest brands, Coca-Cola, Disney, eBay, FedEx, many others, of course. And now UserWay is making its best-in-class enterprise-level accessibility tools available to small and medium-sized businesses so everybody can get in on the action. Operating an accessible and compliant website isn't only the right thing to do, it also makes business sense. Why? Because millions of people are going to require UserWay just to purchase your products. If your site is not accessible, you're leaving a whole lot of you know access and sales uh, inaccessible, essentially. They're, they're not going to be able to purchase your product, and that's why UserWay is so valuable. And when you need to scale, UserWay makes that even easier as well. For years, UserWay has, has been on the cutting edge, creating innovative accessibility technologies that push the envelope of what's possible with AI, what's possible with machine learning and computer vision. UserWay's AI automatically fixes violations at the code level, doing it automatically, right? Like scans, recognizes, and fixes it so that the visitors uh, of your site don't know any different. They just know that it's accessible the way they need. Here are some, you know, just a couple of things that UserWay can do. It can auto-generate image alts. So it's essentially writing image descriptions for you, and that's the power of AI analytics, being able to take a look at these images and recognize, you know, in real time what it's looking at, turn that into text. That's super valuable. Remediates uh, complex nav menus, which can be just a really difficult challenge for companies. UserWay actually ensures that all pop-ups are accessible, fixes vague link violations, fixes broken links for you, ensures that your website makes use of accessible colors. That's an easy thing to overlook. But the, the important thing here is they're not changing you know, the, the colors of your logos or anything or your brand, they're remaining true to your brand. They're just taking the, the non-accessible colors uh, throughout your website and fixing those so that they are. And UserWay gives you a detailed report of all the violations that were fixed on your website so you know exactly what's going on under the hood. UserWay is platform agnostic. So if you're using WordPress, Shopify, Wix, um, AEM, Sitecore, SharePoint, I mean, there all sorts of integrations. It doesn't matter the platform. UserWay is going to work on it. Let UserWay help your business meet its compliance goals and improve the experience for your users. And actually, the voice of Siri, who many would consider the best, uh, the, the most popular voice assistant out there, most recognizable anyways, has a message about UserWay. Hi, I'm Susan Bennett, the original voice of Siri. You won't hear me say something like this too often. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're looking for. But every day, that's what the internet is like for millions of people with disabilities. UserWay fixes all of that with just one line of code. UserWay can make any website fully accessible and ADA compliant. And with UserWay, everyone who visits your site can browse seamlessly and customize it to fit their needs. It is truly magical. It's also a perfect way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. It's putting your money where your mouth is, basically, and showing that everybody deserves to go to your site. Go to userway.org slash twit, and you'll get 30% off UserWay's AI-powered accessibility solution. UserWay, making the internet accessible for everyone. Visit userway.org slash twit today. And we thank UserWay for their support of All About Android. And now, it's time for some app news. So, 
I, longtime listeners and viewers of the show know that Jason and I have a nice, playful relationship, right? And like we often, uh, there are specific topics that each of us get interested in that we like talking about, <laughs> that we like covering. Oftentimes yeah. we say that like, oh, Ron's on the foldable beat or, you know, or, or Jason, I don't know, what are some of your, what are some of your, your stuff? Um, uh, you know, RCS, like, if there's an RCS, RCS story, I'm probably yes, talking about. For, yeah, <laughs> for all of us, right. Um, now it's at the point where I think Jason is trolling me with these interests uh, because here we are with a little bit of app news about YouTube music. Uh, and this is just enough to drive a grown man crazy because uh, YouTube music is actually going to make some changes to the free users. Um, specifically, background listening will now be offered for free, no longer requires a premium account. So previously you needed a premium account to have That's background good. listening. Now they're giving it free. That's a good change. Yeah, um, that, sh that should have happened a long time ago. That should have, totally. But then, uh, you know, there's two sides to every coin. Um, free users now, will no longer get music videos in the app, right? Which is something as a premium customer, I would pay them more to make happen. <laughs> Just get the videos out of there. I totally agree. I don't want totally the agree. So if you're using YouTube music for free, you're pretty much as close to Google Play Music as you're going to get these days, ironically. <laughs> That is true. Yeah. That is yeah. true. So, yeah. So good on you, Google and YouTube Music. Keep tweaking the product, and maybe someday someone can fix my GD uh, home hub and have it not play music videos when I ask oh. them to. <laughs> Man, no kidding. No kidding. Uh, Tashaka, what, what is your music service of choice, and do you have uh, as much of a love-hate relationship with YouTube Music and Google Play Music as we do? You know, <laughs> interestingly enough, I have been diving deep into the world of uh, high-res audio and yeah. master MQA. So right now, for me, honestly, it's it's Tidal. Um, right Tidal, their catalog of master files of obscure hip hop is exceptional. Uh, I found I have found like '80s hip hop tracks. That I would have that I haven't been able to find on the internet anywhere in title in mass. No kidding. Oh yeah. So so that kind of won me over. And then there's a lot of great jazz that's been remastered and spatial audio. Uh, so there there's some really good because I know people said uh, uh, some of the spatial audio, some of the uh, Dolby Atmos specifically, uh, some of the tracks are kind of wonky. They're not really what good. And it really is up to how people master them. But I've found a lot of really good jazz, old jazz that's been remastered in, in Dolby that is just, it, you feel like you're in the middle of the jazz quartet or whoever's playing. It's, it's, it's wonderful. That sounds one. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Cool. Um, yeah. I haven't, I haven't explored very much of the spatial audio to be honest. It's, it's uh, it's like well, I'm, and now all the services seem to support it to some degree, right? Like I know Apple Music has for a while. I think YouTube Music does. Do they? I know Spotify does. God, I, I could be wrong. I know there are ways on Android to really dive into the spatial audio. I just haven't spent a whole lot of time with it. Maybe it's just, maybe it's the type of content that I'm looking for uh, isn't isn't supporting it, or I, I'm not really quite well, sure. Well, I'll, I'll give but. you one to check out if uh, if you like the Doors. There's yeah. a remastered version of Riders on the Storm uh, that's a Dolby Atmos track, and it is absolutely a joy uh, to listen to. And when you're listening to this, are you listening to this in like a 5.1 room, or do you have a special set of headphones that you're using? Yeah, uh, earbuds. Uh, uh, now, earbuds. because uh, specifically with Dolby Atmos, you don't need anything, any special earbuds. You can plug up, uh, well, you to none of your phones you can't plug up uh easily three and a half millimeter but you can you can That's plug true. up with an adapter to uh you know a usb-c adapter a lightning adapter whatever the type of device you're using uh and, and plug in you know some headphones and of course the quality of it is going to be uh dependent a lot on the quality of your headphones but um but yeah, you can do it with Bluetooth earbuds or headphones, and and there's, like there's some old Curtis Mayfield, and there's a, a Parliament Funkadelic. A bunch of these have been remastered or redone in, in Dolby Atmos, and man, they just they they're 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 good experiences. When you find some good nice. Dolby Atmos where a producer knew what they were doing, yeah, it, right, it's, it's it's transformative. 
Yeah, because I mean, on the producer side of things, that is a whole other skill. You know, they're so yeah. so accustomed to to mixing for for the stereo, the stereo. and not the yeah. not the multiple speakers. So that's a whole renaissance that seems to be happening right now. Yeah, uh, in the music world. Cool. I'll have to look that up. I will definitely look into that because I'm I'm curious, but I haven't really known like where to start. You know, so I'm happy yeah. for that suggestion. Thank you for that. Um, let's see here. Google is changing the pay structure for subscription based apps in the play store. So it used to be 30% uh, fee for the first year, 15% after, right? And they had made that change like a year or so ago. I can't remember how long it was, uh, because Apple had made a similar change now a 15% fee. So no longer the 30%, you know, for the first year thing, it's just all 15%. However, ebook content and on-demand music streaming services will will be eligible for fees as low as 10%. The strange thing here is that Google doesn't really <laughs> doesn't really share like who that's for or how you get it. You know, they, they ultimately still have the power to decide which apps qualify for that lower amount and they're not really sharing like how you know, th how, how any service, uh, auto, you know, finds their way into uh, applying and, and being accepted for that lower amount. So I don't know what that <laughs> is, but, uh, but I, I think, well, ultimately this is going to incentivize developers to offer more subscriptions instead of straight up one-time payments. And that's either a good or a bad thing, depending on who you are, I think, <laughs> because, yeah. you know, we've been subscriptioned to death in some, in some aspects of our lives. But, uh, I don't know. What do you think? Is this 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 has got to be the result of regulatory pressure? I mean, we're we're seeing so much regulatory well, stuff happening with big tech right now, right? And all of those lawsuits and all of that, every, yeah. like just the, the the rising thing of it. I'm not surprised by it. I don't the, know. The the heat is is intensifying. Yeah, yeah week after week after week. The so, H is O as the H is O as they say. The well, and I think on. with some developers, um, you know, they get that one time fee. And but they still have to develop the app, and, you know, over the course of time, and especially yes. if it's an app that's a quality app. And so then totally. you wind up with apps that are on the market and no, and they haven't been updated or they're just not as functional as they first were because the OS has been updated, but the app hasn't kept pace. So one, one of my pet peeves, uh, pet peeves with Tashaka, is um, people want everything free. And they want a great standard of living. You, yeah. If you want a great standard of living, you're going to have to, somebody's going to have to pay you, right? So if you want a great app and you want it to stay great, you might have to shell out a, a buck or two for it. And then for a really good app that's really well done where the UI and UX actually make my life better, I'm willing to pay a few dollars. It, it keeps the developer developing and it keeps me with an app that works the way I want it to work. Indeed. Well, you Even know, though I don't as like we subscriptions. Say, yeah. Yeah. As we say on the show many, many times, all the time, su uh, support your devs. That's what it's yep, all about. Absolutely. Right? I'm a big uh, proponent of that. Support your devs. Always support yeah. your devs. Absolutely. So, um, uh, and, uh, and another and, and another company supporting our devs is Microsoft, uh, who promised when they announced <laughs> Windows 11, uh, they announced Windows 11 would the new operating system would actually support Android apps. Uh, but open release Windows 11 still didn't support Android apps yet. Uh, so now beta testers are being given the green light to test the Windows subsystem for Android. Uh, and how this works is apps are loaded via the Microsoft Store. Those app entries actually point to apps on the Amazon App Store in order to load and install them, which is just bananas. Um, <laughs> wow. app, notifi app notifications will also appear in the Action Center. Um, and Windows accessibility features will extend into Android apps as well. Uh, it's currently a library of 50 apps, and more will likely be added when support is broadly launched for all Windows 11 systems. So this seems like they promised something, and now they're trying to figure out how to make it work. That's what it seems like. <laughs> yeah, they, they they knew it was going to be a feature eventually. Now they're now they're kind of rolling it out. I don't I don't know what what it ends up getting like how useful it is. I mean, I guess you know Android the Android ecosystem has an insane amount of of apps and and games and everything available. So it's never a bad thing to open up your platform to also support Android apps and, and games because that's <laughs> that's a massive amount of titles and, and possibility there. But I don't know. 
I, I'm not I'm not pining to to pull Android. I've got a Chromebook and I've and I've used a Chromebook for so long and I've rarely ever used Android apps on that and that's had that option for for so long. So it's kind of like it's nice to have. I just don't know how I don't know if it's going to you know encourage me to use Android apps on my computer. But uh, am I in the minority on that? Tashaka, what do you think? Are you looking to load up Android apps on your desktop computer? Uh, yes and no. Yes, for social media apps, because because of the nature of what I do, I spend a lot of time in Instagram and and Facebook. And, and thank God Instagram has finally actually made it so that you can now upload from a browser, a desktop browser, mm. a laptop browser. So that, that makes my workflow a lot easier. Uh, but I think this is a long-term play because if you look at like the Microsoft, uh, the Duo 2, the Surface Duo 2, you know, this might be something that allows them to bridge uh, the, the divide for them between smartphone and desktop and make it a little more seamless because they're basically making Android phones or phone uh, now. And I thoroughly love my Windows phones personally. Uh, I, you know, I may be in the minority on that one myself, but um, so <laughs> I, I, I could I could get with it. And with the Chrome apps, I could see younger users um, using that. You know, as much as they're into uh, social media on TikTok and Snapchat and things like that, yeah, I can see yeah. kind of having that cross-platform utilization. Uh, I can see that being big with the uh, generations coming behind us. Not personally, me, not something I would use a lot, like I said, other than a, a, some core apps that I use profes professionally on this web thing we do here. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, like see, said, it's better I mean, to have it's, it and not need it than need it and not have it. There you yeah, go. I love that. It, 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 seem, it seems like a really good idea. It seems like a great way to extend the platform, stuff like that. But it's like the Amazon App Store integration, just it's, it's oh, that scream yeah. that screams like someone came up with the idea. How can we do it? Well, we don't want to build an app store. Well, Amazon has an app store. Let's partner with that. Like you hear the right. conversation <laughs> happen, the progression. Like you could do it right, right? And but like here, but by doing it, they would have to catch up to Google and the Google Play Store with Play Protect and everything. Google's been doing this for a decade. Microsoft has started like they should. Microsoft should have been doing this years ago and be in a position of being able to offer the services the way they should be instead of relying on a partner like Amazon, which is a subpar a subpar experience as it as it already exists. So I don't know. Agreed. It's, yeah, it just seems broken. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, let's see here. Don't go anywhere. We have more coming up. We've got some of your emails coming up next. AAA at twit.tv is the email address if you want to send us an email and we will read it on the show. And if we have things to say about it, we will say things. Uh, <laughs> starting with this one. Hold on. It's, it's long enough that I can't see who it's from. There we go. Jack <laughs> from Chicago. I like, wait, uh, no, no, not Jack just from Chicago. Jack from suburban Chicago. Suburban oh, so Chicago. Thank you, Jack, for that to say. So Jack is not in the loop. Jack is on the outlier <laughs> part of Chicago. Maybe in Palatine. I don't know. Maybe, you know, <laughs> but uh, thank you, Jack, for the specificity. So. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> Jack says, a week ago Sunday, I woke up to a completely dead Pixel 3 XL. I spent all day trying every trick I know to get it to boot back up. The thing is completely bricked. I can't even get into the bootloader. Of course, this is two days before the Pixel 6 announcement. My backup phone is a Nexus 6P with a battery so bad that if it gets below 50%, it will randomly shut down just turning on the screen. Oh, I remember that. So I ordered the oh. Pixel 5a 5G from the Google store and it arrived Tuesday. I had the exact same experience that Jason mentioned where I could do everything except receive incoming text messages. I Googled the issue and found the same, having to get my account provision to CDMA lists. I ran to my local Verizon corporate store and explained the problem. They checked the provisioning and that didn't fix the problem. I also saw people mentioned needing a new SIM card. When we took my SIM card out, the guy helping me was like, wow, I haven't seen one of those in years. That's when I realized that I was still using the SIM from my first generation. Moto X. So a new SIM card was installed. It took around five minutes to connect and everything worked like it should. Just thought you might like to know since you mentioned your wife's 5A wouldn't work on Verizon. And that is true. This is on my list. I have heard from a few others 
that I need to take it back into the store and just get a brand new SIM card. Pretty sure she did that already, but I wasn't with her when that happened. So I don't know what that, you know, how that transpired. Um, so I'm going to go with her hopefully here pretty soon and we'll take the phone in and see if that solves the problem. But I'm feeling a little more hopeful because Jack from Sur suburban Chicago uh, says that it worked for him. So uh, thank you for, for writing in on that, Jack. And uh, oh, now that I have the Pixel 6, I should test this on the Pixel 6 too and see if that, if that um, SIM does the same thing in the 6 because the 6 also has a Verizon version and then an unlocked version and they're different. And if you get the one that's for Verizon, it's probably going to work perfectly on the Verizon network out of the box. <laughs> If you get the unlocked one, you have to do some of this voodoo magic in order to make it work. So um, I'm going to test that out and see what it is. So well, and the unlocked right ones uh, do not have um, millimeter wave support. Right. So That's right. There's that. Which, if we're talking which for me might be an issue. For my wife, I don't think she'd care. She's like, I don't mm. care. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so. Sounds like my wife. Yeah. Yeah. Did you go bowling? Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> All right, Ron, you got the next one. I, I like the, I, I, I paused for a moment of them going bowling together. That was pretty good. All right, our next, email <laughs> comes, our, our, our next email comes from Carlos, who says, Hello, I have an Asus ROG 2 and was able to install Google Clock from the Play Store. If I have a repeating alarm set for every day, I'm wondering why I can't ca cancel or dismiss today's alarm with the Google Assistant without it canceling future alarms. Uh, I see the option in the notification shade when I pull down my upcoming alarm to dis dismiss today's alarm, but I can't seem to figure out the correct phrase to get Google assistant to do this the phrases i've tried with the assistant have been uh cancel today's alarm snooze my alarm until tomorrow dismiss today's alarm skip today's alarm the response i get from assistant is okay your alarm is set for every day at 4 50 a.m has been canceled um carlos i think assistant isn't good at some things and I yeah. think this is one of them. And I think that YouTube music on the Nest Hub is another one of them. And I think that there's a, <laughs> we're, there's a growing list of shortcomings within um, within Assistant. And I don't have the answer for this. I mean, Jason, have you did you try playing no. with this before the show? Like, I yeah, I I don't know. This is, this is one of those emails that I'm like, oh, surely the rest of the community is going to know the answer to this because <laughs> I, I'm, I'm of the same same belief as you, Ron. Like, there are just certain things that Assistant isn't capable of yet like maybe at mm -hmm. some point they bake this in um kind of seems to me that like the the ai training model on these devices should be smart enough that over time it, it hears certain things and it can kind of figure these things out but it doesn't it i don't think it necessarily works that way even though sometimes yeah. google says that it does you know it learns over time blah 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 but i don't know that that necessarily means that it like figures out how to temporarily disable an alarm for a day and still you know keep it going the next day that's going to take some developer intervention would be my I guess and i don't know that they've necessarily put that in there explicitly right well if anybody knows knows a solution for this or can help carlos email us at triple a at twit.tv so we can help carlos mm -hmm. so, there you go. of course <laughs> if the alarm goes off all you have to do is say stop you don't even have to say hey g Right. Yeah. So there's right. that. It's conversational. Yep. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that makes any it any better for you, uh, but <laughs> there you are. And finally, we have this week's email of the week. Jacob, you are the email of the week. With this email, you wrote, "I've noticed one thing missing from phone reviews that would be very helpful to me: signal strength." or more accurately, antenna strength. I had a Pixel 3a when my wife and I got married and I moved into her house, which is in a rural area. I had no problem getting a signal on my phone until the day I upgraded, in air quotes, uh, to an S21 Ultra. I then had to spend even more money on a signal booster to get two bars on my top of the line Samsung. I can't find any reviews that bring signal strength up. As soon as I heard your guest last week say the top of the Pixel 6 Pro was plastic, or another material to help with signal strength i immediately got online and pre-ordered one are any of you able to notice any significant differences in this area between the 6 pro and other phones you've been using thank you jacob for writing in i haven't but also understand that like right now at least in my situation i'm at home a lot like this is this is where my life is at, at home you know interspersed with little bits here and there that i'm leaving the house but i'm not spending nearly as much time away from my home internet 
uh, th that I was two years ago, that's for sure. And so understanding the, d the differences in signal strength on these devices, it's a lot harder for me to get a real, like real world every day lived with sort of um, kind of uh, awareness around this. So I'm not that aware of it based on my own experience with it. I've had no problems and I don't know if that's just because I'm in a good area or that it's a good phone, you know, as far as that's concerned. I don't know. Um, either of you kind of had any experiences that make you think that things are different and in the Pixel 6 land versus other devices that you have in this regard? Um, what I have noticed is that, so um, in the world of your mileage may vary, um, where I work during the day, T-Mobile was the only carrier in that building. It's a, it's a black hole for cell signals. It was the only carrier in that building for a long time that got any decent signal and got any decent data uh, uh, signal, in this case, uh, 5G. And um, a conglomerate put up a high rise next to me and murdered all that wonderful signal I was getting. And so when I come uh, out of the driveway from the building, uh, the six, Pro has been real fast to pick the signal back up and and get me going again. So um, I noticed that it, it grabs signal pretty fast. Um, in the building, I've had numerous phones with me: uh, iPhone 13 Pro Max, uh, the the Pixel, uh, a couple others, and it and and they go in and out of signal all day because of this new construction that's going up. And the the, the Pixel 6 Pro seems to um, do that a little less, but I know it's struggling just like the other phones are because it's it's mm. also draining my battery faster uh, as mm -hmm. it's doing with all the cell phones, smartphones I'm te I test because when they sit there with me, they're just struggling for that signal. <laughs> yeah, it's they're terrible. just looking and looking like, where is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah I know yeah. what that's like. Um, well, so I don't know if that's that's helpful, uh, Jacob. Um, but you're right. Um, <laughs> this this is a feature that a lot of reviews could do you know do well to to point out a little bit more. And uh, we appreciate you writing in because maybe this will yeah. help uh, other people to kind of move that up on their priority list as well. It's certainly something. It's it's important. It is important. And I have had devices where it's so obvious that it's not good in this regard. And you know, when it comes down to usability, when I encounter that, that's something that I write down and I and I note down and I make sure to talk about. So, um, but when everything's good, you don't know that things could be bad. And so, you know, I think probably what happens is when things are fine, you know, people don't end up talking about it because there was nothing that really stood out to them to otherwise. You know what I mean? So maybe that's what we're looking at too. But thank you so much for writing in, Jacob. And thank you. Congratulations. You are the email of the week. All right. We have reached the end of this episode of All About Android. It's been a lot of fun. And Tashaka, really appreciate you carving out some time to hang out with us tonight and talk all about the Pixie 6 Pro. <laughs> thank <laughs> the you. The pleasure of mine. Thank you for inviting me. I've had a blast <laughs> chatting with you gentlemen. Right on. We will definitely be hitting you up and having you back on. Uh, for so, sure. So be on the lookout for that. We would love to have you back. This is kind of the opportunity that, that you have on the show to really pr uh, plug or promote anything you want. So if you uh, want to point people anywhere, what do you want to point them to? Well, uh, you know, I've been actually, I've, I've, I've been on the web for some time. So I, I've actually been quite taken aback with the reception I've had from people online. And I love chatting with you. I uh, love talking to you. So you can hit me up on Twitter at Tashaka Armstrong, Instagram at Tashaka Armstrong. Uh, I am a smart aleck. I, I, I speak fluent uh, cynicism and sarcasm so uh, we can have some fun and uh, go some rounds. Uh, I'm there if you want to chat about anything. And, 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 and just one thing on the commercial you ran about the um, accessibility, one thing I would challenge us all to do as tech reviewers, and I've done this in, in some of my videos and not everyone, is specifically on Android devices, Google does a really good job of, of putting some accessibility function on, functions in there, like live caption during phone calls. And, yeah. and, and so when we review devices, when we review a Samsung device or a OnePlus device, testing those features out and seeing if their overlays and UIs 
break them, which they often do, uh, would be mm-hmm. you know helpful to a lot of people. And I know I've gotten really good feedback from people when I've uh, tested those features, and I think it's something that we should all try to help uh, our our the 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 deaf communities and and in the in the blind communities and the different communities in in whatever way we can uh, when we do our reviews. So that's just my little kind of thing. Yeah, I love that. Right. Like that's that's important. There's probably not as many people out there who are reviewing these devices paying attention to that. And as a result, there is a community of users who are underserved, who have these questions and don't have proper answers for them from the people who actually have these devices in hand and could actually, uh, you know, make make those points and and, uh, help help them in their buying decision, too. So that's a really great point. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. And thank you so much for coming on to Shaka. We will have you back soon. Perfect. Appreciate it. Thank you for having Keep me. up the great work. You bet. All right. And Ron, thank you as always of each course. and every week. Uh, what, what do you want to promote? What a delight this episode has been. Shaka's awesome. Um, so yeah, follow me on Twitter and on Facebook at RonXO. Um, and you guys hear me talking about Scorbit a lot, talking a lot about pinball. Those of you who might be in the Chicagoland area, like, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, our good friend Jack from suburban Chicago. Uh, this coming weekend is Pinball Expo and Scorbit will be there. Unfortunately, I won't be there, but uh, my, my partners from Scorbit will be there. And if you come on Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, Central Time, uh, we'll, they'll be doing a talk about behind the scenes of connected pinball and also we'll be in the jersey jack pinball booth showing off how scorebit works and everything so if anybody's going to pinball expo uh go have a good time play some games for me and check out scorebit um and thank you thank you for everything and you can download scorebit in the google play store on the android app it's pretty awesome do I it think. i don't know i'm biased yeah yeah i, th- I think it's pretty awesome too yeah. i think it's awesome <laughs> thank you ron uh thank you burke for everything at the studio. Thank you, Victor, for everything, turning this podcast around and putting it in people's podcast feeds and editing and all that. Um, This week, so let's see here. Leo's out of town for the next week and a half, so I'm going to be filling in for him on This Week in Google tomorrow and next week, also for Leo on Security Now, as well as the other shows that I'm doing. But the thing I want to promote, I made the decision that I'm going to do Movember (laughs) this year which is you know a it's great because you know i've i've had a couple of years really focused on uh on my own mental health and it's been really awesome so i'm kind of doing it in dedication to to mental health and and you know men's health in, in that regard but also because i have never in my entire life grown my facial hair out for an entire month and i'm slightly i'm slightly terrified about what it's going to look like i i i fear that it's going to look like really weird and like not good but i figured why not do it for a cause so you're going to hear me probably at the end of of the shows for the next month talking about it movember.com slash m slash jason howell twit and uh there you go i'm raising money for for mental health and uh there you (laughs) <laughs> and I apologize I think in advance. You're delightful with a beard. You're you're gonna look delightful with a beard. Join you know, us. I, Join it's us. gonna be great. It's gonna be great. <laughs> it's gonna be funny because I know for a fact. I mean, well, I'm pretty certain that there's no hair that grows here. So it's gonna be like total patchwork. This is why I've never grown out my my the hair on my face. So it's a it's a journey we're all on, and I'm sorry in advance. Um, <laughs> Club Twit is twit.tv slash Club Twit. That's our ad-free subscription tier. All of our shows with no ads. Also an exclusive Twit Plus podcast feed. We throw lots of extra content in there. Sometimes the pre and post show from All About Android goes in there. And a members only Discord channel. It's all all of that for $7 a month. It's really a lot of fun. Um, Not only the ad-free content, of course, but participating in the Discord and everything. $7 a month. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. And I'm finalizing things around the best of episode uh, for this and all of our other shows. Twit.tv slash best of if you have any last minute suggestions. Haven't really had that many. I've had to kind of go solo on that. And that's totally fine. But if you think of anything, go there. Twit.tv slash best of. That is it for this week's episode. We do the show every Tuesday. We publish the podcast feed to twit.tv slash AAA. That's where you can go to find all of the feeds that we support. Audio, video, YouTube, everything is there that you need to know about this show. So visit it, twit.tv slash AAA. And thank you so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time on All About Android. Bye, everybody. So long. Yeah.
If you find yourself talking to those virtual assistants in your house quite often, or maybe you can make your light turn on and off with the touch of a button, well, Smart Tech Today is the show for you. Join Matthew Casanelli and myself, Micah Sargent, every week as we talk all about smart stuff and the fun that comes along with it.